you've got a set of buildings like these skyscrapers, a flat brush is going to be much better for the brush stroke. So I'm going to use my three quarter inch and my half inch. Right, this one I want to build up really in layers, wet on dry, because they're crisp edged rather than rounded. They don't need to blend too much. So I will do a wash for the sky and then build up successive layers with the brush stroke. I'm going to use the Prussian blue with the alizarin crimson and paint it not too strong across. When you're laying a wash, try not to go too much over the area before because you want the colours to blend together without heaping too much more paint onto the layer before. So just bring it right across. Do you see how they just sort of join up gradually and they're not overlaying each other too much? Now the sky wash is dry, we can come in with the lovely edge of that flat brush to create the shapes of the buildings. See how you use the side of the brush? I'm a great believer in not overdrawing your underdrawing because if when you're painting you find yourself having to really look because you want to know what it looks like, the brush stroke will usually have a bit more information in it because you've had to look more thoroughly. I'm just going to add a bit of that red into this wash here and now I'm going to turn the brush this way to bring it down to give me a nice sharp edge to the building as it comes down here. Just to give myself This building's really light here, so I'm going to leave that one out of the wash at the minute. Come down the side again, just bringing this brush. See, I put it across, and if I want a sharp edge, just pull it down the side here. Do you see how this goes up in tiers? And the brush is just perfect, just each step that goes up straight across the top. Oh, it's a much higher building than that one next door and then comes down in tears the other way. So now I'm turning the brush this way to marry them across as I come down. You see, to make sure these are level, come across. Let's use the smaller brush for some of the structural detail within the buildings and the shadow sides of the buildings. See how versatile the side of it is? The gap between the buildings is easy to pick out. Take some of the colour off the brush just to bring down the linear structure within these buildings. Really, each brush stroke is actually bringing out the shadowy side or the shadow cast between buildings or a darker building behind a lighter building. So each brush stroke is doing its job of building up the painting. easier it is to use a flat brush for these linear strokes than it would be to use a round brush. And so we could build on and on, we can make more and more detail or we can just leave it quite nice and loose like that. One of the loveliest qualities of watercolour is the way that it skips across the paper and leaves a broken edge. Like in these little fishermen here, you see the edge of the sea? How the edge of the wash breaks up across the paper. Or as in the case of these children here, where the little flecks of white between the colours of their jackets is left between the wash as the paint just skips across the surface of the paper. These two papers are Cardi paper, 
which is a nice rough paper. Let me show you what happens to a brushstroke because it goes across different papers. Here we have a hot press paper, so it's very smooth. Let's take our round brush, our size 12. It's not to do with entirely dry paint this, it's to do with the pressure of the brush stroke. So if we take it across a hot press paper, this is really smooth, take this paint across, we can break it up by lifting our brush stroke, but its tendency is to then join up again because it can spread across this smooth surface. On a knot surface, it will break up in the same way, a bit more, and look, it won't join up in the same way, it'll stay divided, so you've got more control over that broken brush mark. On a rough surface, now you see, skipping across the top of the paper and creating even rougher, and they're not joining back up again because there's no way they can flow, they're divided by their troughs and their rises of, of, the, of the paper. And then I'm going to show you on the cardi paper because this is a lovely, very rough surface and sometimes you almost think it's resisting your brush stroke. See how it really almost objects to the paint coming across it and I'm trying to do the same pressure each time on that. We can take this lovely broken edge quality to the brush stroke even further with the dry brush stroke. On this backwash of shutters, I want to create texture on the wall and wood grainy texture and old sort of weathered texture on the shutters. And I'm going to show you how to use the dry brush stroke. You can use any size brush. We're going to use round, we're going to use flat. I want you to really look at how much paint is on the brush, how people think it's dry, dry paint. It's not dry paint, it's how little paint there's on there and again, the pressure, how you press down. So watch. Let's mix up some alizarin and Indian yellow. Now, when you mix it up, press down so you start to splay the hairs of your brush. Take the excess moisture off. So let's start here. Bit too much water on there. Take it off with your brush. Now, that's better, but still a bit too much. Do you see, it's not that the paint is dry, it's that you haven't got too much on the brush. And as it skims across that tooth, it creates a dry texture. It's not unlike the texture you can create with wax, wax resist. Now, let's look at the wood grain. We know that that divides up beautifully and makes the single hair line, so that's perfect for our wood grain. Hmm, Viridian. Do you see now I'm really splaying those hairs in the palette? And then I bring it down. Now, do you see that wood grain, that line make it creating the wood grain? Each individual hair is dropping its load. Now it's nice to have the stroke go right way down because obviously the wood grain is going to go right the way down. And then if we want to paint the smaller area around the window, we use a smaller brush. Again, splaying the brush in the palette, turning it on its side. This isn't a particularly rough paper, this is just ordinary knot paper, but if you keep it really just skimming the top of it, the dry brush work just catches. And as the, as the paint's coming off the brush, you can almost even scumble it on. In this final section, I want to talk about the life in a brush stroke. The immediacy and apparent spontaneity of a brush stroke gives it life, and figures are the ideal subject to show that. If I'm painting figures quickly, obviously outside normally, but I've got photographs here, I would prepare my colours up front so that the colours can run together and keep the immediacy of the brush stroke movement and the wet in wet runs together to create that movement in the stroke. I would start with just running in a burnt sienna wash for the head and then down to the hands, They're just straight, the hands just coming straight out of the clothes and then immediately come in with some indigo Brush stroke comes down, his trousers are lighter. If one foot's higher than the other, the leg immediately looks like it's walking towards you. Don't need any shoes or feet on it. Draw out his shadow. 
and a little top knot of hair just to darken the top of his head. And already he's a figure in action coming down the street. Now let's take somebody a bit more colourful. Let's have this boy in red. Start with my burnt sienna. His arms are crossed across himself. His legs coming down. Knee bent, other foot behind, so this foot's forward. Red shirt. A bit more colour. Leave out the light on the top of the arm. Bring the brush stroke down. And then I've got some ultramarine, or is it indigo? Not quite certain which on the brush. Shadows of the shorts. And we're going to give him some darker shoes. Just to take across his shadow. That way. Although actually, given that these characters are all going to be on the same page, maybe it'd be better if his shadow goes that way too. Underside of the legs have more shadow in because they're going away from us. And a little tint on his head for his hair and just to catch the undersides of his arms while it's still wet. And that's really all you need, just a tiny, it's, the brush stroke itself is, makes the life, creates the life. Don't overwork them, don't, Try and finish them, try and, otherwise they become static. Let's take this lovely lady here in this rather nice turquoise t-shirt under a black top. Now it's a back view, so this time I'm starting with the colour of her hair. And she has got um, a sort of pigtail which is creating different lights. That's the first thing to go down. Then the colour of the skin runs into that. And the turquoise of her top. In some ways it's always easier to do figures if you are outside because you're forced to paint them quickly. If you're working from photographs it makes you take too much time. So try and imagine that the figure is moving on and that you haven't got the time. From all the subjects we've painted, I hope I've shown you that it's not the subject, but the way you lay those brush strokes down that makes a painting live. I hope I've inspired you to make every brush stroke count so that the subject that inspires you will live. Imagine if you only had 50 brush strokes. I bet you'd make everyone count then. Now available on DVD. Try these techniques yourself at home whenever you wish. The extended version of today's workshop is now available to order on DVD from the Painting and Drawing channel. For further information and to order your copy, go to www.paintingdrawingchannel.com.